Well, we are at the bottom of the hour. Uh, we have a couple people watching with us. So hi, Twitch. If you're out there watching, uh, talk to us in the chat. This is just kind of a group environment. Talk to us. We'll talk back to you. Um, Drew and I are going to hang out in the chat. Uh, but Josh is going to take over in a moment. He's going to talk to us about durable functions. Uh, hey, Rail Shark. Um, so that's actually Greg from local group. Uh, Thompson, uh, nice to see you. BT Welch, howdy. Yeah, lots of good people out there. Um, if you're new, yeah, no one recognized Drew with the quarantine beer. <laughs> you're going to get some comments on that, bud. Oh, yeah, I've gotten plenty. Uh, Alf Wine, hi. Glad you can make it. Uh, and we are going to record this, and this will end up on YouTube after the fact. Um, and if you're new to my channel, I I stream on Twitch all the time, so hit that hit the heart up at the top and give me a follow. It doesn't cost you anything. It makes me feel good. That's all that really matters, right? Is making sure Kevin feels good. Uh, but you're not here for me. You're here for this uh, this guy. Wait, over there. I, I got to make sure I get my directions right. So on my screen, Josh is on my left, but on the Twitch screen, he's on my right. And that's weird. <laughs> but Josh was going to cancel on us. I was. And we had him schedule. Actually, I had to reschedule you, didn't I? Yeah. Well, I, we hadn't really gotten the reschedule. And I feel better about that now because yeah. I forgot the reschedule. So it all worked out. But, you know, thankfully, COVID. I mean, not thankfully for COVID, but COVID happened and no one can go anywhere. We're all virtual now. And Josh is like, well, I don't have an obligation. I guess I can do your little user group. So <laughs> he's here with us. And you're going to talk to us about Azure Durable Functions, which sounds super exciting. And uh, if you can't tell, there's an awesome logo for Durable Functions that's plastered <laughs> for Josh's screen. Um, <laughs> But if anyone out there has questions along the way, uh, drop them in the chat. And whenever the time presents itself, I'll, I'll interrupt Josh and ask the question on your behalf. But you know, Josh, with that, we might as well just let you, let you go. Sound good? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Drew, how about you and I turn off our video? Oh, Awesome. Zoom would like to record this computer screen. Hold on one second. Max being fun. He needs me to... You need to give her that Mac. Uh, yeah, it's work. Get a proper Windows machine. I would not mind going back to Windows. <laughs> but all the cool cats are on Macs. I heard the that's cool cats and kittens? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. There must have been an update and Zoom got reinstalled. And Oh, no, it's going to make me quit. No, there's no quit. You're going to make me jump back on the stream and like do a song and dance. I, I think, it, no, it's not going to let me. Oh, I apologize. Go, I go. I, I will so be this is... right back in like five seconds here. All right. Mac security, All right? Hold on. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to change my background. Sorry, man. Are you ready for me to drop off here? Yeah, drop off. I got it. Okay. I'll be right back. I got it. All right, friends. Watch my background. <laughs> this is the stuff I do in um, in conference calls. And there's no sound. I'm sorry, there's no sound. The uh, Zoom backgrounds don't have any sound, but you would hear the click, 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 click. If you're afraid of heights, um, yeah, you probably shouldn't watch this. You should just look the other way for a couple of minutes, but it's a YouTube video of a roller coaster. Um, I am a card-carrying member of American Coaster Enthusiasts, and I am missing some roller coasters this year. Uh, Paul's Chariot, the one I'm currently on, cur <laughs> happens to be um, one of my favorite roller coasters in the world. Um, and uh, ignore the false drop. It's there for engineering reasons. It takes the stress off of the lift chain. Uh, all right, here we go. All right, Josh is coming back, and I guess I should admit him. Okay. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's right. 
Oh, that's hilarious. Okay. Third drop. Oh, this is my favorite right here. All right. That is an awesome way to like buy time. It's yeah. I added reserve <laughs> just for this purpose. Okay. So hopefully th- th- this will be our only hiccup. So we got done. All- we're, we're already done. Right. So no more hiccups. Yeah. All right. Give it a try. Okay. So let me go ahead and share the screen again. There we go. I got, done. I got us. I got a screen share now. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. So let me go ahead and maximize this. And I promise this, presentation is more than just slide decks okay are we live are we good kevin yes okay yes awesome. you're coming in clear so uh my name is josh carlisle i am actually out of raleigh north carolina uh i have been uh, a developer of some fashion or form worn different hats for probably going on 20 years now uh, most of that time has been spent on the microsoft uh, technology stacks uh, pre.net, post.net, um, and more recently in the last uh, oh, seven, eight years, Azure. Uh, so I've been part of the community for quite a while. Um, so I'm involved down here in Raleigh with the triangle.net user group and various other stuff. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in Azure, and I'm also an engineer with the AppDynamics team at Cisco, where we make a, a pretty awesome monitoring platform that I won't be talking about today. Um, but so what are we going to be talking about today? Well, Today, we're going to be going over a brief, a real quick brief overview of Azure Functions and a quick demo just to level set everybody. Uh, I know a lot of folks have, have probably seen Azure Functions in some fashion or form, uh, but it's important to level set that a little bit because uh, um, uh, Durable Functions is built on Azure Functions. So you got to know a little bit about Azure Functions. We are not going to go deep with Azure Functions, just enough so to give you a little bit of context, just in case you haven't seen Azure Functions before. Then we're going to be providing a durable functions overview. You know, why are we even talking about this? You know, what problems does it solve uh, for us? Uh, and then we're going to dive into some, some examples, uh, some code examples. We're going to run a few of them, knock on wood. We're going to run a few of them. Hopefully they'll all be working for us. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up the talk with best practices and some overall guidance. Uh, now, uh, in general, if you got some questions, uh, definitely shout out. I'm going to attempt to keep an eye on the chat window but if not, Kevin or one of the other members of the team will jump on and let me know. So feel free to interrupt. Uh, we can, we've got a small audience, so that's helpful because we can take it whatever direction folks would like. So if you've got some specific que- questions, please chime in. Um, so, you know, we can't really have much of an Azure Functions or a Durable Functions talk without at least mentioning, you know, why are we even talking about this on Azure Functions, right? Well, what is Azure Functions? Well, Azure Functions is Microsoft serverless platform. Right. And there are a lot of advantages of why we want to have, be having this talk uh, about addressing complexity on a serverless platform, because there's a lot of benefits about running on a serverless platform. Right. Uh, so most folks are aware of these days. You know, I don't have to have the, the 10 slides of what serverless is anymore. Obviously, they're servers, but they're fully managed behind the scenes. Uh, the takeaway on this, and it's especially obvious when we're working with durable functions, is uh, because we're not managing the infrastructure, we're not managing servers, we're not managing scaling. It allows us to focus on the code, right? Because that's what that's what we're being paid for. That's where we bring value. That business value is not in your ability to bring up server environments, although there can be business value in that. But if you can actually focus on true business value, right? And that's that's writing code uh, uh, that addresses some sort of business requirement, right? Uh, uh, the, the faster we can get focused on that, the, va- the faster we have some value. So uh, servers are an infrastructure fully managed. We get that automatic scale. We're especially going to be talking about this in a couple of the use cases. Uh, uh, and I'm actually going to be addressing a couple of questions that, that Kevin had when we first started the uh, uh, right, right, right before things kicked off uh, about processing large amounts of stuff, right? Uh, and the ability to scale and scale instantly uh, uh, is one of the, obviously the proposed, one of the advantages, right, of, of serverless. Uh, and then finally, there's some billing advantages, right? You only pay for what you use. You don't pay to keep the lights on. You have all, you don't have all these servers sitting around where you're paying a big bill every month because something gets run every Friday evening for 15 minutes. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages when it comes to kind of the sub-second billing and things like that. So so that's why we're talking about uh, uh, developing uh, uh, with durable functions on a serverless platform because there's a lot of advantages to running on a serverless platform. Uh, but what about Azure Functions itself, right? What is what is a service platform specifically? What is Azure Functions? Well, Azure Functions at the end of the day is really, it's events plus code, really. 
So Azure functions are driven by some sort of event, right? So that could be an event from an HTTP request, which is kind of what we'll mostly talk about today. Uh, but it could be anything from timers, right? Scheduled tasks to someone putting a row uh, in some sort of storage, blob storage or a messaging, a messaging queue, right? Uh, different types of messaging queue, but we're all responding to events. And those events are really important because when we understand the events coming in, we understand the needs of how much we scale. So, uh, so that's why we're, we're considered event driven, right? Uh, and then we have our code, right? So we can offer that in various languages. So event comes in, we fire code. Uh, Azure Functions also has another aspect to it that we call bindings. Uh, and bindings are really about productivity and convenience. Uh, and we're gonna be using those bindings today when it comes to durable functions. Uh, but bindings are input and output bindings. So and essentially what it is, is it, it, it's you know, normally, for example, you'd have to write 15, 20, 30, 40 lines of code to maybe access some sort of native Azure resource, you know, a message on a queue or a, a blob item somewhere or whatever it may be. Uh, this basically takes care of a lot of that boilerplate plumbing for you. So there's a lot of convenience uh, to it. And it's automatically done for you by the runtime behind the scenes. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in the runtime, but it is worth mentioning that the Azure Functions runtime is open source. Uh, uh, so the runtime and the whole environment is open source. We're actually going to be running things locally. So we can do local development. We have all the advantages of that. But at the end of the day, Azure Functions is really just events plus code, right? Now, uh, uh, we have lots and lots of different trigger bindings I kind of alluded to already. Uh, uh, and most of those bindings are revolve around various services on Azure. Uh, there are some generic ones uh, that are available as well, but we have those, the bindings. Now triggers are what essentially is the, is what initiates, it's the event, right? And we'll call, we call them triggers. Uh, so we can get various types of triggers coming in that Azure Functions support. And once again, the whole binding story, right? So it really just saves us boilerplate code. So once again, we're, we're focusing on the value. We're focusing on the code that brings value as opposed to the infrastructure, the code that doesn't necessarily bring immediate value. It's just boilerplate stuff we have to do all the time. Uh, from a purely personal perspective, it allows us as developers to really work on the more interesting things as opposed to the boilerplate stuff that you write over and over and over again every single day. So we have lots of languages we could be choosing from, you know, C Sharp, TypeScript, Java, Python, F Sharp, Node, PowerShell. But today we're going to be focusing on C Sharp. So all of our demos today will be in C Sharp. We'll be using .NET, uh, specifically .NET Core. Uh, historically, there's a couple versions of Azure Functions. The first version was originally just the .NET framework, uh, the, the, the full framework. And, and now more recently, when 2.0 came out, we're up to 3.0 now, uh, a couple years back, we switched over to .NET Core. Uh, that's important for a lot of our audience because it means we're cross-platform as well. We're not just stuck on Windows. I'm doing everything here on a Mac, but I could do it on Windows. I could do it on Linux as well. So our development environments, as a developer, obviously that's important to us, right? I, wanna, I don't wanna have to switch development environments uh, to, to work with Azure Functions. I wanna be where I'm already comfortable today. Well, we have a, we have a pretty strong story there. Uh, you might see a lot of examples of doing uh, a development in the Azure portal. Uh, and it is supported. There are ways to do development in the Azure portal. You can write some code in the Azure portal. Uh, you'll see some of the early implementations of Azure Functions. You'll see some documentation on it. It's fine for a quick proof of concept, just throwing something together quick and dirty. Uh, don't use it for production. Uh, so for production, you really want, we have, a, of course, Visual Studio 2017, 2019. It applies to Visual Studio for Mac as well. So we have some integration there, but more and more popular these days is Visual Studio Code. And that's what we're gonna use on today's demos. Uh, we're gonna use Visual Studio Code. Uh, I'll show you a few of the plugins that kind of help us with development of Visual Studio. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and some various other plugins that I use because uh, it seems like a lot of developers and folks writing code always like to see what plugins people are using in Visual Studio. So I'll share that kind of briefly as well. Uh, but once again, we're gonna be focusing on Visual Studio code today. So that's the quick overview. Let's, let's see what it looks like really to spin up an Azure function real quick because the, us spinning up an Azure function, the experience is gonna be very similar when we start spinning up durable functions related stuff. And uh, Kevin just wanted to do a quick uh, sound check. Everything coming through okay? Yep, sounds good to me. Um, Any questions? And no questions in chat. So awesome. you're good. Okay. While I'm running the uh, PowerPoint, it's hiding my chat window, so I can't see it. So, 
Uh, okay, so let's switch gears here. Shut down my, my PowerPoint presentation. And now I have some pre can code uh, that we're going to use for demos. Uh, but to spin up a new one, we're just going just to kind of show you what Azure functions look like. We have a couple different ways we can do it. Uh, um, I'm going to show you how to do it within the Visual Studio, uh, uh, excuse, Visual Studio Code rather, uh, for a durable function. But in this particular case, I'm going to show you really quick that we can also do it outside of any kind of IDE. We can do it using the Azure Functions CLI. So we've got a CLI that allows us to do, kind of do whatever we need to do. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears here a little bit and move over to like a temp directory because I'm not actually going to use this code. I just kind of want to show you what it looks like to fire it up. Uh, so let's go ahead and this might just be me. Can you bump up your font a little? Yeah, in yeah, that's probably not it's just you. Uh, no, uh, yes, and and I think I can. Um, no, there is no think do. Yeah, um, don't worry about this right now. I'm having a because uh, we're not going to stay in here. All but right, I will address your concern because I'm very conscious of that. Uh, the terminal window is going to cause me some grief. Um, it, it crashed some things last time when I changed the font, so we're gonna leave it alone. I'm just making a directory is all we're doing. Uh, actually, I take it back, let's do this. Let's solve this problem in a different way. Is that an improved experience? Yes, improved. Okay, great. Should have done, oops, I should have done that from the get-go. Zoom in a little bit more. Okay. So I'm just going to get out of this and go back to, and I'm just creating a quick temp directory is all. Okay, make directory. We'll call this HR and Doug AF. Okay, so this is where our function is going to live. Uh, the function Azure, the Azure CLI uh, is generally can be installed behind the scenes when you activate some things within Visual Studio Code. But if you're not in Visual Studio Code, you can do it all through, you can download Node, there's some brew stuff for it. There's a lot of different ways. It's easily you know, searchable to find out how to do that. It's pretty straightforward. But uh, we're gonna do a func, which is the beginning of the command, init. Now I could put a lot of parameters on here, but I want it to be a little bit more interactive. Uh, so it's asking me, hey, what runtime do I wanna use? Well, I'm gonna use .NET, because that's just how we're rolling today. And it's thinking about it. Okay, great. So if we can see here, it's created a couple files for us. Uh, now I could also go in here and say uh, func, well, yeah, actually we'll just open it up in code. So I, I've created a, a local boilerplate that there's no function in this. It's just kind of the, the basic requirements of a function. We have a host.json. Uh, we have a C-sharp project file because I'm doing C-sharp, right? And then we have a settings.json. Uh, every Azure function out there has a host.json. Uh, if you're in the .NET world, you can largely ignore it because uh, everything is automated behind the scenes. If you're in a Node world or a Python world or one of the other worlds, uh, pay attention to the host.json uh, uh, and some of the function.json, both JSON files from a configuration standpoint, uh, because they have more meaning for you. Um, and so let's go ahead and open this one up. So, okay, there we go. Okay, so now that we're in here, lagging a bit. So because I'm in Visual Studio Code, I also have some plugins. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and let it do a restore for us. This is .NET, right? So it's gonna do, it's, a, it's gonna automatically figure out, hey, I got a CS proj here. Uh, I wanna do a restore, it's automatically gonna pick that up. Now, because I'm in Visual Studio Code, I also have a bunch of plugins installed. So I, I kind of started this process with the, with the Azure Function CLI. I'm gonna finish it off inside Visual Studio Code. Now, if I go to over here to our extensions, you're gonna see a bunch of extensions installed here, but really the ones that are important is this Azure Functions extension. And it's gonna install everything that we're gonna be using today and all the pieces that we need. Uh, um, along the way, I have some other useful extensions. We're not actually gonna be deploying anything to Azure because it doesn't, we don't really need to. Uh, today, we're going to kind of be doing all of our development locally. Uh, but uh, there's lots of other plugins that I highly suggest that you uh, uh, probably uh, at least in, uh, take a look at uh, for various bits and pieces on Azure to help you work with Azure within the uh, Visual Studio Code. But we, so we have this Azure Functions piece right here. And if I go ahead and do Azure Functions, I'm just going up to the, the, the command palette here and I can say create a function. Oh. 
And it wants us to initialize the project for Azure Functions because, because I created it outside of Visual Studio. So let's just do an HTTP trigger, right? An HTTP trigger is pretty straightforward. Obviously, this is an API endpoint. And we're just going to keep everything default just because it's not really important. Uh, Azure Functions can have different levels of security. I'm not really going to go into detail at, at, with that today. But just be aware there is some functional level security in addition to some more advanced scenarios where if you want OAuth protection and things like that, uh, that you can do. But, uh, but there, there are various uh, different security options. We're just going to choose anonymous here. So I went ahead and created us a new trigger. Uh, now, the thing I want to call out immediately right here is that we have uh, uh, some boilerplate code that created for us. Now, the first thing I want to call it here is, is, is this guy here. So we can see right away that we have some attributes. These are C-sharp attributes. Uh, and this is an HTTP trigger. This is letting the Azure Functions runtime know that this particular function uh, is going to be executed based on an HTTP request, an HTTP event coming in. Uh, now we can go into some details. Uh, you can build a lot of APIs through Azure Functions, you know, get posts, you can control the route, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, um, this is an HTTP trigger. And this particular pattern you're going to see over and over again, where we have an attribute, and that attribute is bound to a variable. Now, these variables and these types, there's some flexibility behind them. This is some of the binding stuff that I was referring to a short time ago. And, and when it comes to these, you can almost think of these as uh, uh, these are all automatically populated for us uh, by the runtime. There is a concept of middleware and there is some dependency injection available, uh, but a lot of these uh, uh, bindings are automatically populated for us. So they already have values coming in uh, for us. So the big takeaway here, and once again, this talk is about durable functions, not about just core aspects of the Azure Functions runtime. But the one takeaway that you should have here, and this is in general with Azure Functions, is that some of the previous ways that you have, may have done development in the past when it comes to things like uh, um, building web APIs, and, and, and the type of frameworks that you're working with. Azure Functions is a framework, right? Uh, so in many ways, it shares a lot of, uh, um, it shares a lot of details uh, with some aspects of frameworks that .NET developers are familiar with, web APIs, things like that. But it is its own framework. So you can't, sit, you can't go and create a web API project and say, hey, I want this to be an Azure Functions project. So to be able to take advantage of some of the benefits of serverless, we need to live within the Azure Functions framework world, which means uh, uh, we need to make some changes to how we implement things. But I'm gonna go ahead and run this real quick. Make sure I have a, yes, I do. I'm gonna go ahead and run this real quick just so you can see what happens when we've launched stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and once again, if you're coming from a different serverless space, uh, it's fine. If you're coming from a different serverless space, uh, something like AWS Lambda or some of the other places, uh, some of the other uh, uh, platforms out there. And, you know, there's historically a lot of challenges with running uh, uh, serverless functions locally. Uh, the Azure Functions runtime is completely can be executed locally. It's not an emulator. It's the actual runtime that you're using up on Azure, obviously minus the hundreds of thousands of servers running behind the scenes that support you on this. Uh, but in a single instance mode, it gives you the, the exact same runtime that you would have in production. As you can see here, it automatically picked up uh, that we have a, um, uh, an API endpoint. Uh, and interesting enough, if I launch this, and here, let's put a, just to show you what the breakpoint and debugging experience is, I can go ahead and execute this. Uh, where's my control? There we go. And it's off screen, but I'll show it to you here. So we can see we hit this, uh, this API endpoint and we're triggering it and we're going through. Now I didn't pass in parameters, once again, not important, but you can see here, it is fairly quick to get up and running with Azure Functions and just as quick to get up and running with Durable Functions. Uh, so there isn't a lot of barrier to entry. Install Visual Studio Code, install a couple plugins. You can, and I'll show you how to create an Azure Function through, the, uh, through Visual Studio Code, or you can do it through the CLI, which is what I just showed you a moment ago. Uh, but you can get running locally, debugging, everything you need to go. So the, the barrier entry to this is pretty low, right? Uh, uh, and, it, and it's very, very uh, uh, new developer friendly, right? Uh, so now that you kind of have a general understanding of what Azure Functions is, you know, some benefits of the serverless, what the overall developer experience is, let's switch gears a little bit and start diving into some of the detail uh, related to durable functions and, and what the use case is, what the benefits are, 
uh, so on and so forth. So let me switch back really quick to my slide deck. And I promise that is not the end of the code. We're gonna be spending probably a majority of this talk inside uh, a Visual Studio Code project with various uh, solutions in there. So, you know, this talk is about really solving complex problems with durable functions. And so what are complex problems? Well, complex problems usually equate to uh, application complexity, right? And applications are complex because the business processes uh, uh, that they drive are complex as well. So it's just the very nature uh, of a lot of the platforms that we're dealing with and a lot of these uh, uh, applications that we're writing that there's just a lot of complexity behind it. Now, historically, this complexity uh, um, is, is diagrammed, right? Because, you know, human beings are mostly visual. When you have a complex platform, you know, that's why we use Visio. Historically, Visio is really popular in all these diagramming platforms because you can break down the complexity. What you're seeing here in front of you is, is an example of, of a complex flow, right, that we have through an application, a workflow. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and workflow, once again, is both a specific implementation detail and a kind of a generic uh, way of describing this, right? I'm using it in more of the generic context right now where this is a workflow. This is a, you know, we have a user that comes in, and I'm going to switch gears here. And, oops. There we go. having presenter, Mike, there we go, oh, there we go, okay. So we have a user coming in here, right? And, and that user, oh, and it looks like we're having problems with that. I figured we might have problems with that on Zoom, but uh, I can talk through it anyway. We have a user and there's decision points, right? And there's various bits of activities. Each one of those activities uh, may be interacting with external services. They may be interacting with databases. They may be interacting with messaging platforms, uh, but we have a lot of complexity. And many times to manage that complexity, we rely on tools that give us a visual element as well. Uh, a couple common orchestration tools that you've probably heard about, BizTalk, right? BizTalk's been around forever. Uh, uh, I think when, when, I, when I first made my transition from being like an IT administrator in like the mid nineties uh, into development, uh, uh, part of that journey was, was actually like literally my first week, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be a developer now. I went to a BizTalk talk, right? And, and, and it was all about, managing that complexity, managing those processes uh, by building this designer surface. Now we have this today uh, with lots of other tools. Another example is Logic Apps, right? Logic Apps uh, is on Azure and that's a workflow platform where we can do visual designing, but it's not without its challenges though, right? I mean, uh, there's definitely a lot of efficiencies with it. And I've had fabulous success with Logic Apps uh, from the standpoint of being able to quickly build things, but it's also not without its challenges. When you're working with workflows and you're working on a designer surface, you end up a little bit with what, what, I re, what is generally referred to as an impedance mismatch. Now this is generally, the, the term impedance mismatch is generally used when you're talking object relational mappers, but I think it really applies to this as well. And it's because we have a designer surface, right? And that designer surface is visual. And then we have code and obviously code doesn't have a visual element, uh, but Many times when we're switching back and forth between uh, something that's more designer and visual and something that's code, you know, it causes us as developers a lot of headaches at times, right? Because there's an impedance mismatch. What you can do in a designer and how you do it in the code can be completely different. Uh, uh, and in many times when you're a designer, you're sitting here talking to yourself, hey, I can, wish I could just write a line of code. Uh, now, it's worth mentioning Logic Apps. They've done a great job in many other platforms as well of being able to just run that line of code and write that line of code. So there's an improving story when it comes to designer-based workflows. But many times what you end up with is this kind of Frankenstein, right? Now, that's certainly okay for many use cases, right? Especially for the quick and dirty ones, uh, uh, for maybe something that's not super complex to be able to have something that's mostly designed with a little line of code. But you still, once again, you end up with a little bit of this mismatch between the things that you can do in a designer and when you write code and, and managing both of those. But the same thing is on the, you know, it, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. On the code side, you're like, okay, I wish I could run a lot of code. And next thing you know, you have 20,000 lines of code, right? And, and, you, and you sit there and think to yourself, I can't follow what's going on with this code. And so you, it's almost like sometimes it's like a lose-lose scenario. You go 100% in code because you have, want all, you have and want and desire all that power and it becomes unmanageable with the complexity. 
but then you sometimes you feel like you're on uh, you're on rails, right? And and you're you're being guided by the designer. You can't do things quite like you want to be able to do them. Uh, so we kind of have that mismatch there, and that's where durable functions really comes in. So what is durable functions? Durable functions is an extension for Azure Functions, so it runs on Azure Functions. Now today, er, durable function is really intended to be run on Azure. Uh, technically speaking, Azure Functions can run outside of Azure. It's an open source framework. It's an open source runtime. Uh, it actually has some really good stories about running Azure Functions in Kubernetes, uh, on-prem. Uh, there's definitely different places you can run Azure Functions. By far, you know, obviously it has a first class experience on Azure. Uh, um, but today, Durable Functions really kind of needs to be on Azure. We have some plumbing requirements. Uh, uh, that we'll be talking about here shortly, uh, but it really need, does need to be run in Azure. Uh, but Durable Function, once again, is an Azure Functions extension, uh, but it allows us to write workflow in code. And, and, and when I say workflow code, I'm not talking about just code that does the same thing as a workflow. It's actually writing and using constructs that you would expect in a workflow, but doing it through code. And that eliminates some of the impedance mismatch that you have when you have some stuff running in uh, designers or all of your stuff running in designers and you wish you write code or, or vice versa, right? So it, it is an option when it makes sense. Uh, and once again, th th this isn't a, a black and white kind of situation. Uh, uh, there are times when it's definitely appropriate to have things in a designer. There are times when, you know, it's just a better way of approaching things is to, is to write this workflow in code, especially if you have complex code and there's a lot of it, right? Uh, but just as importantly, because we have a challenge dealing with complexity when it comes to writing traditional kind of workflow like in code, it simplifies complex patterns greatly for us, especially a lot of the uh, inherently asynchronous nature uh, that you get, especially uh, in, in Azure Functions today when we're doing a lot of messaging and dealing with a lot of external uh, microservices and dealing with a lot of various different platform pieces, right? Uh, all of that adds a lot of complexity, especially when it comes to asynchronous communication. So part of this is all about making it much, much more simple, right? And then the last piece is it's stateful. Uh, inherently, Azure Functions is stateless, right? It, it, it's, it, it is actually an anti-pattern, right, for an Azure Function outside durable functions uh, to, have, to maintain state. It's not a best practice. Well, durable functions allows you to be stateful, but in a safe way that isn't at its core, breaking some of the core serverless tenants of things you, you should avoid. Uh, and in our case, when we're saying stateful, as of today, uh, we're talking uh, Azure storage and specifically Azure storage queues and Azure table storage uh, is where we're, we're working with it. If you go to some of the GitHub repo uh, for durable functions, you'll see that there are some other efforts underway, for example, to be able to use Redis uh, as a state store. Uh, and what makes that interesting is it starts opening up the opportunity to potentially run durable functions outside of Azure, or at least with less Azure dependencies, right? So this is durable functions in a nutshell. Now I mentioned really quick about uh, uh, best practices and patterns. The interesting thing about this, especially if you're into uh, serverless, right? And, and you, you're, you're connected kind of with the service community, or at least you, you, you follow it, you'll know that there's a lot of uh, uh, best practices and anti-patterns. Interesting uh, enough, when we're using durable functions, a lot of the anti-patterns become best practices. So long running tasks, which you normally want to avoid uh, when it comes to Azure Functions because most service platforms have execution time limits. Azure Functions is no different under a serverless mode. Uh, um, and long running tasks are, are, are a challenge at times, right? Uh, function chaining. One function calling another function, calling another function, calling another function is generally considered a bad thing. And I'll go into why. But in this case, it's no longer a bad thing. Maintaining state, you know, serverless should be stateless. We're maintaining state with, and it's actually a best practice. And we'll talk about how we do that. And in general, avoiding some of the async pitfalls uh, when it comes to serverless is also generally considered an anti-pattern, but it's a best practice now. And we actually, wholeheartedly embrace uh, asynchronous in the C-sharp context. And we'll talk about why that's bad in the first place and, and how we get around that. You'll, you'll totally see that in action. So before I dig any deeper into some of the more details of the different bits and pieces of durable functions and then lead into the demo, are there any questions?
Actually, yeah, we had a question uh, a little bit earlier from BT Welch. He was asking about um, Azure Functions and static IP addresses. He has a requirement where a third-party API, um, he needs to come from a static IP because uh, they need to whitelist them. Is that something that we can do with Azure Functions? Uh, yes, in a way. So Azure Functions is, ba is built on Azure App Services. Behind, it, it's a... It's kind of a, a sibling of Azure App Services, right? So it actually uses the Azure App Services infrastructure behind the scenes. Uh, uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, um, static IP addresses, you can get IP range or whatever it may be. I'm almost positive, and I have to follow up, I can follow up this at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the talk here. I'm almost positive that you can, you can gain what you need through premium functions. Uh, so some of the premium version of Azure Functions, uh, um, and, it, and it's still serverless, uh, but it, it gets you around some of the, um, it, it helps you avoid issues like cold starts, which we were going to talk about, but issues like cold starts and some sort of, and some of the more advanced network uh, uh, connectivity uh, requirements uh, all fall into the Azure Functions Premium. So I'm, I'm fairly certain, I'll do a quick search here at the end, but I'm fairly certain that you can achieve that through Azure Functions Premium. Now, obviously that comes at a little bit of a premium price. Uh, so, you know, take the good with the bad. Uh, but uh, the other thing that you can do, I think, is um, I want to say you can get the group of uh, IP addresses that it could be coming from. Um, because at the end of the day, the Azure functions along with the Azure app services control that load balancer, right? There's a little load balancer, load balancer in front of it that has the IP address that you want. So I think that's the answer, uh, but I'll follow up at the end to make sure. Uh, any other questions, Kevin? Uh, that's all so far. Okay, great. So digging a little bit deeper into durable functions, uh, you know, you might recall from the beginning of the talk, I was talking about the different bindings, the different functions, right? We have HTTP trigger functions. Uh, we had some of the, and I kind of alluded to the fact there are other ones like blob triggers and different pieces. Well, there's various functions that we can work with uh, uh, that provide us different features as well when it comes to durable functions. Uh, the first part is, is actually the durable client function. Uh, this is actually kind of what instantiates new orchestrators for us. Uh, so this is the entry point, and we'll see this in action. This is the entry point for creating a new orchestration when it comes to durable functions. Uh, we also have the orchestrator function. So this function is the function that, 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 that actually manages some of the complexity that we were talking about, and I'll, I'll show it to you visually here. But the orchestrator function is actually managing all the various activity functions. So orchestrator functions generally do not and should not do any actual operator. They shouldn't do any IO. They shouldn't be doing anything other than uh, uh, orchestrating the activities. All of your various moving parts, the, the real activity takes place within activity functions. Uh, so uh, uh, the client function creates a new instance of the orchestrator and then the orchestrator will orchestrate and call all the various activities within that. And those activities actually do the processing. They do the disk IO, not necessarily disk IO, but they do the IO, they do whatever operations that you need, right? Uh, we also have another function type that we're not really gonna really cover at all today. It's called entity functions. It's a relatively new feature uh, that is part of durable functions. Uh, it's, it's almost like an extension of the extension, right? Uh, and an entity function is, the, is, a, is a partial implementation of the actor model, right? Uh, so if you're familiar with some of the various actor model frameworks, it is not a complete actor model framework, uh, um, but, uh, but it is a useful implementation uh, to maintain and, and interact with an entity and the state of an entity. Uh, and there's some, there's some really good use cases, behind, uh, use cases for it. Uh, but once again, I'm not really gonna cover it in today's talk. It might be a future talk there. So let's go back to this diagram that we showed before. And this diagram uh, uh, and how these various function roles that we were just talking about a minute ago apply to this. So in this particular context, the durable client is, is, is where we are at the beginning of the process, where we're initiating a request. Within there, we're going to get a reference to our durable client. And the orchestrator takes care of all of those activities in there and also, if you notice, these lines went red as well of how they interact with each other. So the orchestrator is going to ma manage the state uh, for all of these activities that take place. So this is the workflow right here, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven is the workflow. Now, 
from an activity standpoint, each one of these are individual activities. Uh, so two through seven here are individual activities and would be designed as individual uh, uh, functions, right? Now, to be clear, when we're talking functions, we're not talking uh, functions in the traditional um, context where we have a method on a class that does something simple. When we're talking about functions, this standpoint, it's generally speaking something that has some sort of IO to it uh, is oftentimes, but doesn't have to be, uh, can be um, um, long running or longer running uh, or is inherently asynchronous, right? So if we have five functions in a class and one's like, you know, uh, save the database, send email, you know, th th those traditional things, not every single one of those would be candidates for a function. You could almost look at this from the standpoint of microservices, right? You could almost think of five as a microservice, four as a microservice, six as its own microservice. Uh, and many times what those functions are actually doing, uh, let's say in the case of five, is actually calling a real microservice that's somewhere, out, somewhere else, right? And it's managing that kind of lifecycle over calls to that microservice. So I just kind of wanted to be clear about that, that th this isn't intended to replace trivial logic or non-IO bound logic or non-long running logic that you would normally have in a function somewhere that does something. Uh, you don't want to unnecessarily add a bunch of async remote calls, right, uh, uh, to your code uh, because in some ways, if you don't need to, what, why add that overhead, right? Why add that latency uh, to this? But when it comes to operations that once again are IO bound, uh, um, uh, where it makes sense to, to have it in, uh, maintain separately. Those are really good candidates for activities, right? Uh, so let's go in and let's go ahead and jump into some code and start creating our first orchestrator function. So let's go ahead and end this. Okay. So this is a once again, a little bit of a throw out, throwaway function, but it's, it's useful to, uh, to kind of go through this exercise. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new window. In this particular case, we're gonna create the entire function through Visual Studio Code. So I'm not gonna use a CLI at all. Uh, it's worth mentioning behind the scenes, it's still using a CLI, but we're gonna go through completely through the Visual, Visual Studio Code UI as it's, as it's a pretty, pretty good experience. So first off, I'm gonna to go to, actually, let me, let me open up and make a new directory here. So let's go ahead and open this. And I'm just going to make a quick new directory. Let's go up one level here. We'll go back over to our temp directory. Okay. This just makes it more convenient because it'll create the function in the current folder. Okay, so let's go back here to our Azure function. Now I have a bunch of plugins installed here. So I'm seeing app services, I'm seeing functions and, and I'm seeing lots of different options. I'm actually gonna go through and just go to the functions one. Now I can actually go in and create a new function in Azure right from the get go here. Uh, but we're actually just gonna start with just creating a new Azure functions project, which we can do through, do through here. So I'm gonna click on that and we're gonna go ahead and select the location. We just wanna use the current location. Once again, we want to use C Sharp because we're talking .NET here. Now we have various templates that we can choose from. Uh, you see here we have the HTTP trigger uh, that we that we used in our initial demo. We have lots and lots of other triggers that we can choose from. In this case, I want the durable functions orchestration, right? And, and we're just going to call this this horribly named thing. You'd think that someday they'd be able to create some better default names, but we'll just leave it alone. Now, Durable Functions requires a storage account. I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and actually use a storage account that is up uh, in Azure already. Uh, and I'm just doing that because it's one less process I have to run on my machine while I'm sharing my desktop. Uh, so we can uh, you know, maybe appease the demo gods a bit and not push our luck. But it's worth mentioning that uh, the storage account requirement, once again, queues and table storage, and we're actually gonna see it here in a second, uh, can actually be run locally through an emulator as well. There's something called Azurite. And you can install that as a plugin through, uh, uh, through Visual Studio Code. And you can use that as well. So if you don't have an Azure subscription, you still wanna play around, 
uh, or you don't want to pay, you know, the little bit that would cost. Uh, well, I'll probably spend 15 cents for the next, you know, next hour here. Uh, then, then you can do that locally as well. So we're just going to go ahead and pick an account. I have one already I'm going to use. And we'll just use that. Now it's going ahead and creating the project for us. I want to call out a few things about this project. The first thing I want to call out is if we look in the CS proj file, we'll see that we have a package reference to durable task. Um, Azure functions uh, as of two uh, started being a little bit more granular in uh, their uh, dependencies. Uh, so we always have dependencies on things, right? I mean, we're, we're dealing with Azure stuff and behind the scenes, it's all Azure SDKs. Uh, so they're minimizing some of the dependencies by having additional packages for certain features. This is one of them. So if you're starting from scratch or you have an existing project out there and you start trying to add some of this code that we're showing to your project and nothing's compiling, make sure that you've added this package reference, right? A couple other things to call out here. Uh, we have our host JSON. I mentioned a little bit about earlier, it's host settings. We're gonna mess with this a little bit. I'm gonna show you a couple of settings that we, what we're gonna use uh, in, in one of the other demos, uh, but there's a lot of things you can tweak in here uh, from a host standpoint that uh, impact how Azure Functions ex is executed. Uh, you can tweak some of the timeout settings, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so definitely do some research, but you, there's some tweaking you can do. Most of the time, you can just totally leave that alone. And then we have our local settings. Uh, um, and people can look at this uh, because I'm going to nuke this right after this call here. Uh, but uh, we have uh, our Azure Web Job Storage key. If we were using development, it'd be like use local development equals true. It would, just be, it would use a local emulator. So th th this is just some of the plumbing that we get. The real interesting stuff starts to pl take place here. So let me minimize a couple of these. Let's break this down a little bit. And I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit more. And let's get this out of the way. Just give us a little bit more real estate to work with. So this is the first function I wanna I want to see here. So this is an HTTP trigger function. We saw this before. This is defined that this function is gonna accept an event coming from uh, uh, an HTTP request coming in. Now, this is where we start getting access to our client, right? This is our durable client. Um, I will call out briefly that if you're working with a different version or an older version, uh, you might have some different class names that they've changed over time. Uh, so if you're looking at some old code someday and you're like, hey, I just copied and pasted this in, why is this working? Uh, make sure you use the appropriate version because there have been some changes. Uh, but we have our durable client. And if you re recall, the durable client is where we start interacting with our orchestration. Uh, and we can start a new orchestration by using this, the, in this particular case, the durable client is called starter. And we can say start new async and we pass in the name of our orchestration. And then in this case, we have none, but we can pass in some initial values that the orchestration is going to utilize. Now, the interesting aspect too, is that we are also returned back an instance ID. Instance ID is critical. It is, we're gonna be using that over and over again, instance ID identifies that instance of the workflow running for that orchestrator. Uh, and then we also have a, a nice little pre-canned response that because, because many times these um, durable functions are initiated from an HTTP trigger, they don't have to be, but many times they are, they give us this little convenient response that automatically packages up all the response details of how to work with this, with, with this new workflow. Uh, uh, endpoints to hit, the, the ID, various pieces, and we're gonna dig in some more details on this of, of how to interact with that workflow. They had this automatically packaged up. You don't have to use it. You don't have to return back this stuff. You can customize anything you want uh, if you'd like to, but there's a lot of out of the box features that if you don't wanna have to do a custom experience uh, that you can get away with uh, without having to write, write extra code for it. So we have this uh, request that comes in. Now, if we wanna take a look at the actual orchestrator, we can see here that we actually have this something called an orchestration trigger. This is our orchestration function. It's called an orchestration trigger, and it gives us the orchestration context that we can run in. Now, uh, 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 when, and, and we're gonna go through the flow here in a moment, but uh, this context is what manages the various aspects of, of, of the workflow. Now, in this particular case, this is a pretty simple workflow. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because we have a little bit more of a specific demo for this. Uh, but this is what's generally referred to as function chaining, right? This is one calling another, calling another, calling another. Now, you can see conceptually, this is pretty simple. Uh, and it's easy to understand that this workflow 
is, is essentially, it's gonna call this, wait for that to run, gonna call this, wait for that to run, call this, wait for that to run. Uh, so it's easy to understand, and this starts giving you some of the insights onto why managing workflows through code uh, uh, can actually be rather simple, right? Uh, because those complexities are hidden from us a little bit. Uh, now, I'm gonna go over some of those complexities in a second because they're important for a developer to understand. But when it comes to maintaining and looking at your code and understanding what it's doing, it is really, really evident what it's doing here. Um, so, and then we have our actual activity. So we have a lot of activity names here and I'll, I'll go over some better guidance on how to manage those activity names. Uh, these are pretty bad, uh, but uh, this is just default out of the box boiler template stuff. So each time one of these is called, this activity is actually called. Now it's not called in the same context. This is actually, it's, it's called in a completely separate context. Uh, but once again, it's really easy to follow. It's really easy to understand what this is doing. It's gonna call this, pass in this parameter. And, and in this particular case, it's gonna say, hello from Tokyo, hello from Seattle, hello from London. Uh, uh, and it's pretty simplistic, but imagine if each one of these was taking you know, uh, five minutes of execution time because it was doing complex stuff. Uh, and you'll start to see some of the power of it. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and run this real quick so we can see this in action. And I can show you a little bit about what that response looks like. And while this is starting up, uh, I'm not looking at the, are there any questions? Nope, no, no questions, just chatter. Okay, that's good. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna put a breakpoint just because we can put a breakpoint on, on each one of the pieces so we can see how this actually works. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. I'm gonna put a breakpoint on the activity and I'm gonna put a breakpoint on the orchestrator. So if I go ahead and run this, actually, I take that back. I'm gonna show you the breakpoint on another one, one that's a little bit more interesting. But we're gonna run this, at least start it. So we can see here, we should have a, there we go. It, it has registered API endpoint. We're gonna go ahead and hit command and we're gonna hit control. There we go, let me throw it on our window here. Okay, so we have this and it has hit our breakpoint and we have started our new orchestration. We got our orchestration ID back and we're gonna return the response. And let's bring this back up. I think you're hidden behind the screen here. There we go. Now, this is kind of hard to look at, and we're going to look at a better version of it. But this is an example. Don't, don't worry too much about the details here. We'll, we'll get a better view of it. But this is a bunch of details that that custom response sent back to me, right? And so we're going to decompose that here in a minute. But as you can see here, within just a few minutes here, we got a, uh, we got, we got a, we got a function running here. So what is actually going on behind the scenes here? When I keep on talking about it's managing a lot of complexity for us, this looks pretty dang simple. And, and, and on the surface, it's like, okay, if each one of these were running and taking five minutes, wouldn't I have timeouts? Wouldn't I have all this stuff going on uh, that would impact my ability to run this in a serverless fashion on a function? Uh, well, the durable uh, framework abstracts it all away from us. And let, let me talk really briefly about how uh, that works because it's important because understanding how it works impacts the developer experience greatly. Uh, so, up. So what is happening behind the scenes? That, that, that simple few lines of code, it looks like I already got an animation busted, but that's okay. Um, so what's happening behind the scenes? Well, we have our request coming in, right? That trigger that we were talking about. Uh, and that trigger then goes ahead and creates a new durable client, right? So we have an instance of our durable client. And because we have that new durable client, we're, we're creating that durable client, as you saw before, was referencing the orchestrator. That orchestrator knows that it has a couple activities in it. So as soon as that happens, I apologize for this little, uh, this little animation issue here. Uh, but uh, what happens is uh, the invocation, we create a checkpoint in table storage. This is our state. So right away, we know that the orchestrator is started and we get a new instance ID and we store any values that are, that are, that are, that are put in the parameter, right? Now, we return back the instance ID back to, uh, uh, back in the HTTP request that we just saw a moment ago. And to kick things off, that orchestrator isn't called directly. It's not a synchronous call. It's not like a function call that you would expect 
from the way the code looks. Behind the scenes, it actually triggers a storage uh, uh, queue message behind the scenes. Now the orchestrator wakes up when it sees that message saying, hey, I got I to get started orchestrating a workflow here. And so that orchestrator becomes live, it gets hydrated, it knows what's going on and it looks to the table storage and said, oh, I'm brand new, right? I, I, I haven't done anything before because I know the history because all that history is in our table storage. Well, then it goes on and says, okay, let's start with the workflow. Let's start with one. Well, I know I haven't run one before because there's nothing in my history for it. So let's go ahead and schedule that activity. So we're scheduling it by creating a message in a queue. And as soon as the, the queue message goes, that activity then gets triggered. So right away, we can tell we're doing asynchronous activity here, right? Uh, we are not bound by any execution time limits. The orchestrator goes away. The orchestrator ha ha has done executing, things are living in the activity. The or so the overall orchestration, the overall workflow could take a while, right? Uh, but the orchestrator isn't running during that whole time. It goes away. So we're not paying for anything while we're running something or, and you'll see in, a, in, a, in another use case, while we're waiting on something. Maybe we're, there's no activity taking place because we're waiting for some human, human interaction. And we're gonna talk about that. But we have this activity. Now, once that activity is done, it throws another message in a queue behind the scenes that then wakes up the orchestrator. The orchestrator wakes up and goes, okay, it doesn't know where it's at. It has to read from the state. It has to replay everything. So it goes to one and said, oh, look, one's done. Here's a value. Now that becomes key because one, the results of one could then be used in two if you needed to, right? But in this particular case, it goes, okay, I'm done with one. Let's do two. Same thing happens. Activity two is scheduled. And, and a, a message goes in a queue behind the scenes. And then activity queue starts up. If you notice activity one is no longer running, the orchestrator is no longer running, it's now just activity two. Uh, and activity two is now running and it gets the re results. And activity two is marked down here in our storage as being completed and we store our value. And then once again, we send an item back to the, and I apologize, there's a loud truck outside my window. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but uh, um, it sends a, a message back, orchestrator wakes back up and says, okay, it doesn't know where it's at. It's not like it's pausing some execution in memory. It has to replay everything. So it goes through and checks the activity one was scheduled and completed, done, 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 done. And it says, okay, I know I'm done. One and two have been done. So the orchestration is now complete and, and we can return any overall value. Now, from the standpoint of, well, how do users get the results of this? Well, if it was a use case where the user actually got the results, that would be done by uh, the instance ID that we're returning can then be used to check the status of the request. And you can use various mechanisms. You can pull, you can do whatever you want. Many times it's a fire and forget, right? Things that your workflow is doing are saving to a database that show up on a screen somewhere. So you don't, you're not expecting an actual result back from whoever initiated it. But that's not to say that you can't, and you absolutely can. But once again, it's asynchronous, so you have to implement some way of requesting the status. And there are a lot of uh, uh, baked-in features that allow you to request the status uh, uh, of, of what's going on uh, with that particular um, workflow and that orchestrator. So that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, uh, and, and this is what allows us to say that we are still complying with serverless, right? We're, we're, we're Th th these, are, these are separate functions. Uh, all of this stuff that you see here could be done without durable functions. And, and, and activities like this, if you're familiar with other functions, are done all the time. It is a very, very common pattern to have one function dump something in the queue, another function read it, and, and, and that's how uh, various activities within a, uh, activities in a generic sense, within a function are run. Uh, but by using the durable, function, durable functions, uh, we can abstract all that away. It's still taking place behind the scenes, but we can, we can do it. And, and now we have an easier to maintain code base, right? It makes sense when you're looking at it. Uh, there's a lot of advantages doing so, and it's all abstracted away with a few you know, developer challenges, which we're going to see here in a second. So I'm going to jump into some more demos here so we can see this a little bit more in action. Uh, are there any questions before I continue on? No, just uh, chatter on different subjects unrelated to anything you're talking about. <laughs> did, did, did I see Dapper on there? Yeah, we're talking about Dapper. I've uh, got a Dapper talk coming up too. Yeah. 
I'm Dapper's talking about Dapper on Thursday. I'll post a link to my Dapper talk. Unrelated awesome. to all anything. All Dapper talks. Things. Dapper's all the rage these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so let, let's go back and actually see, see a little bit more of us in action and talk about some uh, uh, some specific use cases uh, that we want to cover. Uh, and, and it's worth mentioning here. Let me pop up this one last screen so you can see the use cases that we're going to cover. So use cases we're going to cover are uh, function chaining. Oh, there we go. Uh, function chaining, fan in, fan out scenarios, right? Human interaction. You know, we're talking a lot about things that go on that are all bound by platforms and systems. But a lot of times business processes, especially the complex ones, require someone to actually participate in it. And we can do that as well. Uh, and then async HTTP requests. Uh, so there are some more uh, um, scenarios and use cases that are covered by durable functions. I encourage you to take a look at the documentation online. Uh, these are the ones I find particularly useful that I've used in production uh, uh, and that come up very frequently. So let's go ahead and switch gears and head over to Visual Studio Code and... So, all right, I'm gonna chime in. I wanna ask you a question related to the scenario you and I were talking about earlier. Yes. All right. I set up an orchestrator and I get, let's say I take a CSV file that has about 8 million rows in it mm -hmm. and I do for each row in my list of rows. Yes. Issue, do async await on an orchestrator and just let it go crazy. It, it'll be done in like less than a second, right? Uh, no. Uh, so, uh, and I covered this a little bit in some best practice, but let me address your question right away. Okay. Uh, so in general, uh, um, you know, we're still bound by limitations of how we store and retrieve state within table storage. Uh, table storage is a great platform for that because it's cheap. You can store lots of data in there, uh, um, but it does have limitations, right? So if you were to do one each, right? If you remember that picture I just showed you, it would create a checkpoint, an entry for every one of those items, you know, a million items, right? Uh, which, which would likely work, but would probably not the best results in the world. You probably have some performance issues with, if you remember like the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the orchestrator function rehydrates, so it has to read its state back, it's gonna read those million rows, right? So my suggestion is, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail uh, in, in, in when, we, when we cover the fan in, fan out, is that you can still use your use case. I think you could still have the success with that use case. Uh, but my suggestion is, is to like, for example, batch it into uh, uh, items of like, you know, 5,000, right? Okay. Uh, uh, where each function is looping through 5,000 records, right? Uh, and that way you're kind of making full advantage of the platform, you're not overloading uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the state store, uh, for all of this and having, and, you know, uh, some issues because of that. Uh, I think the biggest complaint that you will see gen one, uh, one of the larger complaints that you'll see about durable functions in production is that exact scenario that we're talking about where you have very, very, uh, uh, complex fan out scenarios where there's lots and lots and lots of entries into the, into the table. Uh, and I'll actually show you what the table looks like and, and it'll make it more clear, but, um, uh, does that answer the, a short version of your question? Uh, yeah, I guess so. A little bit. Okay. Well, hopefully I'll make you a little bit happier when we get to the longer version. I have to write the proof of concept now. I need to see this in action for myself. Yeah. So, it, well, and actually what I'm going to do here is, is just because we're running, uh, I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, um, so the scenario, we're going to jump to your scenario actually first, because we kind of covered a little bit in the chaining that you saw a few minutes ago. But the scenario that I'm presenting here is an oversimplified version of something of a challenge that I'm actually building in production today for work. So one of my roles at work is workshops. And as part of that workshop, we spin up environments for workshops. So each, each workshop attendee gets their own environment uh, uh, and they get their own resource group and there's a bunch of resources in there. Uh, and then there's an approval process for that. So there's a lot of complexity to it and it really would lend itself nicely uh, for, for building within durable functions because it has a workflow to it, it's long running, it checks all the boxes of the benefits of, uh, of durable functions. So I'm using that as a use case during this demo. This demo does not actually create anything, uh, uh, but for those of you curious, I'm planning on recording me developing that solution in the coming week or two. Uh, so if you're curious, uh, check, check with me on a Twitter feed, I'll probably broadcast out, or I don't know if I'll do it live or not, well, it depends but I'll at least record it. And so if you're curious of seeing what it looks like, 
building a natural solution with this, uh, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, but we had this, uh, 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 this, this workshop builder here. Now in this particular case, let me, let me close this window here. I've got too many windows open. So in this particular case, this is really close to what you saw before, right? Um, this is a, a chain. This, this, is a, this is where each asynchronous request, you know, this in, will, to create a new resource, which in my case could take like five minutes, right? So this take, might take five minutes by itself. This might take five minutes by itself. This might take five minutes by itself. Luckily, even though we have a five minute execution time, they're all running by themselves. So even though the whole orchestration, the whole workflow takes 15 minutes or more, right? Uh, uh, each individual one is, is only taking five minutes, so I'm good, right? This is a good way of, of breaking down a long running process into smaller pieces. But once again, each one of these wait for each other. And this is okay for me right now, right? And this is a scenario where I didn't have any people coming in, right? I, I just, I knew for every workshop in this particular case, I, I, I had three attendee slots. So I just pre-created attendee one, attendee two, attendee three. So this worked out well. Uh, 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 you, you'll just have to use your imagination that worked out well. We'll show you, we'll show you a future one where it's actually running. Uh, uh, but so this is an example of chaining, right? We're chaining one function to the other. Now this could very easily be three different functions. In this particular case, it's the same function called three times with different data being passed in, right? But this is, the, this is an example of function chaining. Uh, and, and once again, this is a little bit like beating a dead horse a bit, but if you remember, all those things that were going on behind the scenes, shooting off messages, listening to messages, all that kind of stuff would generally make understanding what's going on with this, with building a workshop a little bit complex to understand and definitely complex to debug and follow through. In this particular case, we've greatly simplified it without any compromises, right? This looks like it's sequential. This looks like it's synchronous, but it's not. So we kind of have the code maintainability benefits of synchronous with the implementation benefits of asynchronous behind the scenes. But let's go ahead and switch gears over to this groups piece. And this is where, where we start getting into a, a little bit more detail about the, the use case that we were talking about with Kevin here a minute ago. So in this particular case, once again, we have a HTTP trigger coming in to start this particular process. Uh, uh, and this case though, we, it looks a little bit different, right? So for this workshop group creation, we had some different requirements. I actually want to pass in a one to n group, of, one to n number of attendees, and have resources built for those attendees based on their name. Right now, I don't need to, to be sequential about my resource creation. There's nothing. I have no dependency on one to another. I'd much rather have it done. I want. I much rather have all of them done in five minutes than than all of them done in fifteen minutes. Right. And, and so if we do sequential, then everything's done in, 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 in uh, 15 minutes. Now, if I go back to this original workshop builder, you'll notice that we had an await command here, right? This is the signal to the durable uh, functions framework that it should pause on this, on this step of the workflow. This is a step of the workflow. But if we want to fan out, we want to like throw them all out there and just tell me when they're all done. This is where we get into this, th this particular pattern. This is the fan out, fan in. Fan out's historically pretty easy. Throw a bunch of stuff in a queue and it just gets done. Fanning in is a lot more complex because you need to maintain state. You need to understand when all of the stuff you just sent out is actually done. And so in this particular case, we have an attendee list and then we have a task list. We're gonna maintain all these tasks. We're gonna loop through each one of these attendees and, and call this activity async. Now, this is just the name of the activity. Uh, in my particular case, I'm syncing up the function name with the function name attribute with the actual function name. That way, if I have a spelling error, I'm going to get a compile time error as opposed to a runtime error. A little bit of a best practice there using name of uh, as opposed to, you know, doing what I'm doing here, right? Uh, a little bit of a best practice, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, but if you notice, we're not using an await here. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it will keep on adding, right, this activity. And it's not going to wait for each one to be done. And then in this particular case, I have this piece. This is the piece that's important. This is the await all. This is the await. And I'm going to wait for all these tasks to be done, right? So what this means is I could have 100 here, right? And I could have 100 requests all come at the same time. 
And, and, and each time this will keep on rehydrating and we'll still see activity uh, because we're, remember we're maintaining that state within the table storage. So we're seeing all that activity running, uh, um, but, and it's gonna rehydrate each time, but it's doing all the complexity of figuring out uh, what to, uh, when all this is done. So I'm saying when this is all done, then give me the result of this, right? In this particular case, it's just a, it, it, because each one of these, I'm returning back a string, which is the resource group name, uh, it automatically creates a string array. So it kind of understands the results. I'm not doing anything with the results, but I could if I wanted to. Uh, and in this particular case, this is the actual activity trigger. This is the activity itself. And I'm actually passing in the model, right? So I have a model here that I'm passing in. And we can pretend that I'm building out a bunch of resources, but uh, in which case I'm just building out a, a name of a resource group, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm overly simplifying it. But, but in general, you can approach things like this the advantage of this, especially on a serverless platform like Azure Functions, is as I start uh, adding all these tasks, remember behind the scenes are messages. Because Azure Functions understands how to scale based on an event, in our case, messages, it's going to see lots of, if I had a lot of entries here, it's going to see lots of messages coming in and it's going to spin up more resources for me. So this in theory, I could put a ton in here and I'm more restricted in my use case, I'm actually more restricted by uh, the, the, the Azure provisioner saying, no, you, get, you, got, you got too many requests going on right now. I'm actually more restricted by Azure uh, uh, and, and provisioning those resources on Azure than I am my ability to process those requests because this is gonna scale up. Now in the case, Kevin, of your example, what I would probably do is I would be passing in my parameter. Right? I get my parameter out of here and I would do batches of like, you know, a thousand or 2000 or figure out what, what makes sense for you. And each one of these will 2000. Now it is gonna spin up as many resources as it needs behind the scenes. So you could very quickly, in your particular case, I bet you could be running you know, 150 uh, uh, VMs in pretty short order, right? If you do that, I would love to see your application insights dashboard. You got Oh yeah, it only costs two cents. Uh, yeah, it all costs you. Yeah. No, and that, it might cost you maybe like 50 cents. What? Yeah, I know. I know. You might have to like give up on the coffee, but that's okay because coffee shops are closed. So it doesn't matter. You got the spare Breaking money. Breaking my bank, man. <laughs> but, you know, but this is one way of doing that scale out, scale in. Uh, just for uh, the sake of time, I'm not actually going to set up a ton of breakpoints on this. I'm actually going to kind of let it run and, and, uh, um, and, see, and see the outputs and the results. But so let me go ahead and, and run this because I actually wanna show you some of the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to what it looks like in storage. So we have this, we're gonna to go to groups. Okay. So that's fine. Breaking the cardinal rule of having an async function with no awaits in it. Okay, so we got a couple, oops. You know what? It's it's running a lot. It's running the wrong one. Yeah, I'm running the wrong one. Sorry. Actually, it's okay. I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to go to the next one. I'll show you the next one. I actually I have multiple projects here. I'm just running the wrong one. So let's go to the another interesting one that that is very very useful. I use this very frequently, and this is the approver. Uh, and this is actually gets a little bit more interesting as well because this is external. This is all external approvers, right? So in this particular case, before I want to actually uh, uh, before I want to execute, create all these resources and pay a lot of money, right? Uh, in my particular case, I figured out that for me to run a workshop for each one of my users in our labs uh, for a day, it's about 60 bucks a day for each user. I kind of, I kind of figured this out. So I don't want to do this or let it run any longer than necessary, right? Because all that adds up. So I want some sort of approval first. Now, this is an example of getting an approval workflow with someone external interacting with my workflow. So in this particular case, once again, we're initiating things through an HP request, nothing new here, right? Uh, and then we go on to our actual, uh, right here, our actual orchestrator. So in this particular case, I am creating two new uh, uh, activities that are going to be, and in these particular case, these aren't my own custom activities. These are external activities. So I don't have to write any code for this. I can just say, hey, listen, I am, I am waiting for an external event and I'm gonna give it a name, in this case, primary and secondary, which is essentially like a primary prover and secondary prover, right? Uh, so I don't even have to write an activity for this. This is, there's plumbing baked in uh, to Azure Functions and Durable, durable Functions. 
uh, that will provide me this plumbing I need, you're gonna see it in action here in a second, uh, to be able to wait for an external event. And then once all the approvals are done, and, and if, they're all, if they're all true, right, then we can say the result is, uh, is true and the workshops have been approved. Otherwise, you know, somebody didn't approve it. Obviously this is pretty simplistic logic. We could have something more advanced, but it's either all or nothing, right? Uh, uh, and now we need a way to interact with uh, and raise the event, right? At the end of the day, this could be, you know, someone gets an email and there's a link to it and that link uh, takes them to a page. That page has an approve button on it and it hits our API. Something has to kind of pass in the, the details of saying, hey, uh, the approver did this. It could be a link on a site. There, there needs to be a little bit more work to tie this together with an actual end user because they have to do something. But at the end of the day, you're calling an API. Now in this particular case, there's an out-of-the-box API, which I'll show you in a second. But in this case, we, we're, we're gonna use a, a, a custom API because it's just a little bit more friendly than the out-of-the-box one. So I've created a API that does a post that passes in the instance ID, which is important, and the approver type, right? Uh, uh, so that's primary, secondary. And then just an approve. This is just an arbitrary REST endpoint that I'm hitting. Uh, 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 and, and some way, the end user is going to do this. I'm going to simulate it myself, but at the end of the day, it'll be a website or something. Somebody's going to do something. Uh, uh, and in there, we have a reference to our client. Remember, that client's important. That's, the client is how we're interacting externally with our orchestration. So in this particular case, we're saying, OK, we have our instance ID, which is the instance of our workflow. And we want to raise an event that says the approver type, which is either going to be uh, a secondary or primary, and then the value of that. And for our particular cases, we're, we're passing in whether it's approved or not approved. This is going to raise the event for us and allow, allow the orchestration to continue. So I'm going to set a, break, a couple breakpoints here. We'll actually see this in action here. So let me go back into our debugger and make sure I pick the right one this time. So we're going to pick approvers. So we're going to run the approvers. Now I have a, a nice convenient APIs that I can hit that we will use. So in this particular case, we are going to initiate the, uh, we're going to initiate the workflow and we're passing in a few, uh, some, some values to initiate the workflow as soon as this uh, function gets going here. Uh, yep, we're working, good, okay. So this is going to initiate our workflow. Here we go. Okay, so we're, we're debugging here, right? So we're starting our new orchestration. We're starting our new approval, approval process. And let's go ahead and let it continue. Now you'll see here, this is the response I was referring to her before. This is the baked response that you get out of the box. You could always customize it. But as you can see, it's giving us an ID. That ID is going to be important. We're going to be using that momentarily because we need that. Uh, and we could use some of the baked pieces. And when I said we can have an out-of-box event, here's one right here, the send event. I could use this as is and replace event name with, a pro with primary, secondary. It's kind of ugly, but if you want to do something out of the box and support out of the box without writing a code, without writing an extra API endpoint, you can do so. We're using a custom one because it's a little bit of a better experience. Uh, but so let's go ahead and uh, before I lose that screen, I am going to save this because I need this as part of my URL. If you remember, we're passing in, oops, ooh, totally copy paste the wrong thing. Let's try that again. Okay. Come on, there we go. Okay, so we have our instance ID that we'll use here in a moment. Okay, so we have that in place. Let's go, let, let's go ahead and, and let that continue on. Okay, so the next thing we want to do, the orchestrator is kicked off and, and it has gone through and close that window. Okay, just double checking something. And so that should have, I should have hit this breakpoint. Not sure why I didn't, but we'll continue on. Uh, so let's go ahead and initiate the the request. So this particular case, we're going to do a primary approval, right? So I'm going to go ahead here and send the request for primary approval. We should hit a breakpoint, which we are. 
Let's make sure this, uh... okay, there we go. So we have our primary approver and we've approved this and we're gonna go ahead and do our, uh, our raise event, which we have the instance ID. This is the primary, remember that was important. And then whether it's approved or not, which is true, which we are approving it, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and continue on. Now, at this point in time, our durable, uh, excuse me, our orchestrator is kicked off because our orchestrator is rehydrated. So it's gone here and says, okay, let's wait for this. So if we go here and hit next, hit next, you notice I'm not awaiting here, but I'm gonna wait here. So if we notice here, nothing happens after that, right? I could put a few pieces of code in here, but that's actually as appropriate because all of these have not been completed yet. So we didn't await, right? So because they aren't done yet, and I could have done this a little bit different way to make it more obvious when we're debugging it. But uh, the next button I hit, we'll, we'll see here in a second that we'll have it and we'll be able to go on to the next line. And that's kind of a little bit about some of the quirks with the developer experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the secondary one. Go ahead and let that go through. And now we're back here again. Once again, we're replaying everything, right? This is, this is how durable functions work. We replay this every single time. And at this point in time, if everything happened, there we go. We can see here that, oh, it's true and false. So it's actually gonna fail. I must have false in there somewhere. Uh, I didn't realize that. Uh, uh, I was probably testing something. But we can see here that we've rehydrated it. It's made it to the await and we've, we've supplied it with our workflow logic. And then we can go in and say, okay, is this approver all we can see if they were both approved or not and we get the output that we expect, right? But that's just a really quick way that we can interact with external events. You could, this could easily have been um, some sort of text messaging platform. Uh, it could have been, uh, um, you know, a link in an email. It could be like anything, right? As long as at the end of the day, it calls that API either through a custom one or out of the box that has the right parameters passed in that, uh, that it can participate in that. Now, Let's talk, uh, in the last few minutes we have here, let's talk a little bit about a couple other scenarios really quick. Uh, one thing I, I do wanna talk about is a little bit about is about resilience. So, you know, things never go wrong online, right? The cloud never fails, cloud's never down, there's never any problems. Uh, but uh, in my world, that's not really true. And so becoming resilient is, is really important. And one of the things that is baked into the framework is this uh, concept of retry options. Now, one piece of resilience that I didn't show is in that approver piece, we could actually put a timeout. You know, we could say, hey, after 48 hours, just fail this whole thing and give it a default value. So if somebody doesn't respond within 48 hours, default it defaults because it means that, you know, they, they didn't approve it uh, uh, from that standpoint. So there's some options for timeouts, especially, which is really important to do when you're working with, 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 with people, right? Uh, this, is a, this is a retry option that if you're familiar with things like Poly, Poly's framework, where it has resiliency to it. You can set a lot of retry options, number of attempts, back off policies, a lot of advanced features that allow you to say, okay, I wanna call this activity with the following retry policy. And that gives some resiliency to your service. Uh, this is an example of this, I'm, I'm planning on using this when I'm creating my resources. If, I am, if I'm getting throttled by Azure saying, okay, now you got too many requests in to create resources, you gotta wait. Uh, uh, I don't want to have to like, like rerun the whole the whole job and reinitiate the whole request again. No, I just wanted to write, try try back in thirty minutes, right? And so I could easily have this say, okay, go sleep for thirty minutes, because this is all just messages behind the scenes, uh, messages and timers behind the scenes. Uh, it doesn't hurt anything, right? We're using the out of the box features to to, to add some resiliency, but I'm doing without having with, with writing very very minimal code. Um, the other thing that's important too is when it comes to uh, 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 sub uh, uh, orchestrators. So sometimes in our particular case, we have two orchestrations. I don't wanna combine the approval orchestration process with the group creation orchestration process because it makes things too complex. I'm putting just like any other workflow, I'm putting too much stuff in the same bucket, right? But we have this concept in durable functions of a sub orchestrator. That sub orchestrator allows us to use existing orchestrations that we've already developed like approvers and groups. Uh, uh, and, and, and stitch them together under one master orchestration. And this is really what this looks like from this standpoint. So I could easily, for example, call the start approval process and call this sub orchestration 
And once the approval process is done, I can say, okay, if it was approved, then call this other orchestration that I just created uh, for the actual build out. So it allows me a little bit to manage complexity. Once again, uh, there's, there's such a thing as, you know, there, there's, there's such a thing as too much of a good thing as a bad thing, right? Uh, you can go down a crazy path of sub orchestrating and sub orchestrator and sub orchestrator. You don't want to, right? You want to keep this sub -or orchestration process reasonable, right? Uh, um, but it's, it's worth mentioning that we have that. Uh, the last little piece that I'm going to show you from a feature standpoint is the HTTP request. And this is just dang convenient. Uh, this is new in the latest iteration of, of durable functions. And really what this is, it comes down to this little line of code here. So this is one of the rare occasions that you can put logic inside the orchestrator, right? The orchestrator trigger. Normally you don't want to do this. Don't want to do this at all. You don't want IO in there. But in this particular case, there's a feature calling an HTTP async. What's nice about this is it's using all the HTTP module stuff behind the scenes that you would normally use, except it's intelligent. If you return back a 202, and if it returns back an accepted and there's a location in there, that implies an asynchronous HTTP call. And a lot of them could go out and take care of gathering that for you later, right? So instead of having polling, there's a lot of APIs out there that are fire and forget and you got to go back and check on things. Uh, um, it will automatically go out there and check at the location and look for an okay code and grab the value for you and pull it back for you. So it makes asynchronous HTTP requests, which can be kind of a royal pain, uh, especially when you're polling. And it does it in a nice way, right? There's, it, it'll do some back offs and a couple other things, especially for some long running async. So, so super, super useful. Uh, now I've got like, just like four minutes left here. And that's great because I only got a couple slides left just to kind of wrap up this discussion here. Uh, any, any, uh, any questions, Kevin, before I wrap this up? Nope. Looks okay. good. Great. So let's go over some just some last quick elements here. Versioning. Uh, versioning is tricky. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can approach versioning. Think about having a workflow. You got a bunch of workflows running and you change the logic behind the workflow. What do you do, right? Well, you can upgrade with no workflows running. So you just wait for everything to be done and you run. If you can get away with that, great. It's not very realistic at times, but if you can, you, you do that. Another thing is just let them fail, right? Let them fail, let them die for whatever reason uh, that you change. Because remember, we have all that state. We can just replay them, rerun them, right? Uh, so th there are some options for that as well. Um, we have this concept of a, of a task hub behind the scenes. That's a task hub is essentially uh, uh, the bucket that all of our table storage is in. Uh, and you can always create a new task hub, which is essentially at the end of the day is you're, you're creating parallel functions. You almost have like version one of a function, version two, and then version one, when it gets all done and, and it's drained all of its workflows, you start using version two. Uh, so you have some options for that as well. Uh, uh, and another, another uh, concept is versioning your orchestrators. So if you notice that there was a version title on there where it was a function name, you could do function name underscore v2 and just start using the new one. The old one's still in place, new one uh, has some versioning. But the, the takeaway here is it's something you need to plan about and consider. Uh, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna realize you have some versioning woes uh, on the day of the release. Uh, a few best practices. Kiss. Uh, no, I'm not kissing anybody. Uh, it's keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> um, used to hear that all the time when I was in the military, kiss. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but seriously, uh, you can go overboard with durable functions just like any other workflow platform, right? So uh, try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, keep in mind that uh, anything, uh, your parameters and things being passed into your activities need to be item potent, meaning they need to behave the same if you execute them again. Uh, in particular, uh, within your orchestrator, you should not be creating new GUIs or date and time parameters. Uh, there are some, if you need those things, there are some baked in tooling into the durable functions runtime uh, and, and, and that durable functions client uh, that will do that in a way that will not break durable functions. Have some monitoring strategy. Get some visibility in this. You need to understand, there's a lot of complexity. You need to understand kind of what's going on. Uh, application Insights is working on some features that allow that. Um, they quite frankly need to do a better job and they know it. Uh, uh, so there is some efforts underway with Application Insights. Uh, there are other monitoring platforms like the company I work for, AppDynamics. Uh, we actually have a pretty good story around durable functions uh, to get visibility into that. So, uh, but just keep in mind, have, ha have a plan more than just looking at logs. Uh, and then once again, plan for versioning. 
Uh, but uh, I am out of time, uh, but I appreciate you stopping and you know joining me for the evening on this. Uh, definitely reach out to me on Twitter, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, happy to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, I'm always open for questions. Uh, and like I said, I'm planning on doing uh, some either live or recorded coding of implementing durable functions uh, with uh, some real world scenarios, building out my workshop resources. So if you're interested in that, follow me on Twitter. I'm sure I'll tweet how to, how to watch that. So, but Kevin, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad fun. you can make it. Hope you learned something. I learned a bunch. I'm ready to go put this stuff in action. Awesome. Yeah. So, 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 so you're gonna you're gonna ditch logic apps now and write all your code? No, 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 no. So <laughs> no, 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 no. Because there's so much stuff I don't actually want to write code for. I there just you go. Like, That's the right okay. answer. That is absolutely the right answer. Yeah. Because when I write code, things go wrong. <laughs> so every line it, of code is a line of debt, right? Yeah. And actually, you, one of your slides summed it up perfectly. Uh, it's like, sometimes I say, if I could just write code, and that's exactly what I do with my logic apps, is I hit this point, like, if I could just write a line of code, this would be easier. So I go write an Azure function that does it for me. And now I'm highly considering, all right, there's a couple of places where durable functions and uh, orchestrators will, can help. And I like to experiment with those. And, and if you want your head to explode a little bit. Yeah. And I can kick that a stuff logic off app called with a logic app. Running a durable function. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, right tool for the right job, right? It's, exactly. It's always better to have more tools in your tool belt, more options than, than the alternative. Square peg, round hole. <laughs> yeah. So that's actually one of the things I might do tomorrow. I might play with durable functions. I have some ideas. So... Awesome. All right. Well, chat, now's your time. If you like to throw a couple questions at Josh, he'll hang out. Um, if not, we'll, we'll let everyone go. Well, so we'll give it, we're on just a short delay. It's not a, it's not very long. Uh, so we'll give it about 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I'll yeah, just... that was throwing me off a bit. I'm, I'm not used to live broadcasting and watching my same Twitter feed yeah, and don't do that. Ooh, kind of your head hurt a little bit. Lots of thanks out there. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, so I am going to send everyone over to Dev Around the Sun. Uh, if you haven't checked this out, it's a 24 hour long uh, conference where they're featuring speakers all around the world and they're raising money for Direct Relief, which is a nonprofit um, that is helping people affected by COVID-19. Um, so if you just want to get some good learning in, they're about 12 hours in to the event. Um, but it's definitely worth your time if, if you make it over and just want to watch. I know other sessions are going to be available on YouTube when everything's said and done. But Josh, you have anything else? If you missed part of this presentation and would like a repeat, I am giving the same presentation tomorrow evening to the triangle.net user group. Well, it won't be the same. It'll probably be a little bit different. It'll be slightly different. It's always different. I never give the same presentation twice. Uh, so if you didn't have your chance or, or you'd like to try to play stump the chump live, you will have another opportunity tomorrow evening uh, to throw me for a curveball. Good times. All right, everyone, the raid is ready to go. I'm going to send you over to Dev Around the Sun. Oh, and... I have a SoundCloud. I'm just kidding. No, I don't. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, unsubscribe. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone, take care. The raid is happening now. Have a good night. All right. And let me stop the.